Yeah, it was looking a little iffy there for a while with all the rain coming first and then the snow and cold. <laughs> I went to electronics school in Des Moines, Iowa yeah, back in the late 60s, 67 through 69, and I tell you what, it was cold up there. Didn't have any four-wheel drive. We used to go everywhere with just one wheel driving us. But I guess we used our heads more and we didn't go where we shouldn't go. But anyway, and then I had a hot rod, a 68 charger, that was worthless in the snow. It had so much power you couldn't get anywhere. So uh, I was better off with my old 54 Chevy at that time. <laughs> I'm going to look at something this morning that's uh, always important to be reminded of no matter what part of the year it is, but what we want to look at this morning is unity under the cross. Jesus said, and we know it's true, that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, so we want to look at unity this morning, and unity is possible with love, forgiveness, spiritual maturity, work, and hope. VBS and church camp illustrate perfectly the joy and the power of working together. There's just nothing like working at church camp. There's just nothing like, and it's work, <laughs> and there's just nothing like doing your own vacation Bible school. Now we don't have any children at Hannibal. When I first moved there, Hannibal was having somebody else kind of do their VBS, but I got us all together. And we started doing our own vacation Bible school. And the kids, when by vacation, by, I don't know how the old churches used to go a whole month for vacation Bible school or even two weeks. Because one week you are dragging when you get done. But there's so much joy in you, so much happiness in you because brethren are working together. Men and women, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're helping each other. They're thinking how, you know, what kind of visual aid can we make? And one sister says, well, we can do it this way. You know, it's great. And, and the Lord tells us, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, we'll start there this morning. And the Lord wants us to be demands us and and we need to be in unity first corinthians 1 verse 9 and 10 say god is faithful you ought to look that phrase up in your bible and see how many times that's said it's, that's a wonderful thought god is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship hear the unity there the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is in unity with us. We are in unity with him. It's called fellowship. It's, it's a sharing with each other. Then it says, Paul says, now I, I'm using New King James. It might read a little different than your Bible. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's, he's pleading by the, the highest name that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment and of course he's not talking about dislikes or likes he's talking about foundationally with the word of god as our guide we can be saying and knowing the same things uh, some people are more mature in the Lord than others. God understands that. But we can be in unity if we stick with the word. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, a, ver a, a chapter that's used mostly for weddings, <laughs> and first chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 was really written because the nine gifts, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit are talked about in chapter 12. And, and they're having problems because some are thinking they're better than others because, well, I can speak in tongues and you can't, whatever. And then chapter 14 explains it better. But chapter 13, Paul tells them how they can get out of this judging one another and arrogance and pride. And the only way you can do that 
is through love. And begin with verse 4 so we don't run too much time. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, prideful. It does not behave rudely. Uh, I think I told you last time that Paulette used to call me Rudy because when I was young, I was, had a fast tongue and a fast mind and I wasn't grown in the Lord like I should be, or like I am now. And I'd be sarcastic and unkind. So she helped me with that and then I helped her be stronger from my strength. So there's nothing like having kind strength. Isn't that what God has? Isn't that what Jesus had? So it says, um, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked or easily provoked, your Bible may say, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, Bearing all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things for, for the Lord. Love never fails. Now this chapter is talking about, when it says fails here, it's talking about this quality of love. This love is not going to fail. But miraculous gifts are going to cease. That's what the rest of the chapter is. But we have... Faith, love, and joy here. And the last verse it says, And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It's the foundation. Uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit starts out with the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit produces fruit in us. And we know what those things are in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now in Philippians 2... Uh, a lot of the time, Philippians 2 is used to show how Jesus humbled himself to the Father, emptied himself of his uh, prerogatives of deity. He didn't quit being deity. And how he humbled himself, even to the point of death on the cross. And then when he humbles himself and dies on the cross, he's exalted by God. If you want to be lifted up by God, you got to get down before you move up. And that's what Jesus did. But now, Paul is using Jesus' sacrifice and humility and willingness to do the will of God to explain to us how we're supposed to live in unity. Now, let's look at verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation or encouragement... In Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord or one soul, your Bible may say, and of one mind, one thinking purpose. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then from verse 6 through 11, it explains the example of how we are to be humble before the Lord, humble with each other, share and help one another. Jesus humbled himself to help us, didn't he? Even the death on a cruel cross and a wicked scourging that almost killed him, killed lots of people. They never got to the cross. A lot of people died during the scourging, the whipping. So uh, the Lord... Uh, wants us to be in unity and he, he teaches us how only only when we cling to the same cross only when we cling together at the cross can there be unity 
we heard that very sound ringing in those songs, didn't we? One especially that I'd never sung before. That's one of the neat things about us coming over. We get to learn new songs. So unity, first of all, is found in love. Uh, we must love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, body, spirit, mind, strength. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John uh, 4, verse 19 says. And then Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 9 is, uh, and what that's talking about, Jesus became human, a little lower than the angels. Uh, and and uh, he kept his deity, but he came not just as a human. Philippians says he came, for, he was in the form of God, he came in the form of what? A servant, a servant. And then he did that in a human body, and that human body permitted him to die on the cross for us. Brothers and sisters, we must love each other. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus says, you know, uh, it's, it's love when you're willing to lay down your life for your brethren. And he says, you must love one another. Now, here's the key to the, the 34 and 35. He said, I'm putting this paraphrase now. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Now that's the key because back in the Old Testament, the command is to love. What is it? Exodus 17, 3. I've forgotten now. Back in the Old Testament, the brethren back then were supposed to love each other. So love is not the issue here in verse 13, just love but the kind of love that Jesus had, and that is sacrificial love, putting oneself aside to help the other. Isn't that, would I die for my wife? You better believe it. But I'm going to try to live because I don't want anybody killing me because when I'm dead, no telling what they're going to do to Paulette. So, don't come to my house thinking you're going to overpower our household. Because <laughs> I love my wife like Christ loved the church. You know the, you know the feeling. You know what I'm saying. We're in unity that way. Plus that, I taught her to shoot a long time ago. And you don't want to mess with Paulette with her little 308 in her arms. And I keep it locked up for that reason, because when she gets mad at me, she can't find the gun, see? So... Uh, we're supposed to have that same kind of love that, that uh, Jesus had for us, which, which is mind-bending. But it's possible, if it wasn't possible, uh, God wouldn't command it. In 1 John, uh, John is often called the apostle of love. If I can get my old Bible here going for me. 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 10, it says... In this, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, are made known. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. John 13, 34 is the beginning he's talking about. Jesus saying that, not just in the Old Testament. That we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother or sister is a murderer. Man, that is strong language. He is a murderer. 
And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This also tells us that eternal life abides in us. John usually calls eternal life the fellowship that that we have with God and Him. Uh, John 17, 3 tells us that, that those who know God have eternal life. Now, Paul usually talks about eternal life as heaven. John usually talks about the relationship we have with God right now through Christ while we're in the body as, as being uh, eternal life. So he says, by this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, brothers and sisters. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts his, up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now that means you all need to get together and buy me a new pickup truck. <laughs> Because my old 95, I call it, I call it Gertie Berg. My mother's name was Gertie, Gertrude. And it used to be Burgundy when it was new in 1997. And uh, no, that's not what this is talking about. <laughs> Worried some of you, didn't it? <laughs> oh, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know because he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for a brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart, it's our decision. From him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love for the progress of the local church is the only way the local church will ever make any progress. That's the only way. We can't just be pew packers. We have to have going forward, like it says, walk in the light. What's walk mean? Well, it means walk. Well, what are you doing when you're walking? You're making progress. We're supposed to make progress as we're in the light. Not just stay in one point. So, God, God put everything he had into the church. He didn't hold anything back. He gave us Christ, and, and the church is a centerpiece of, of his creation before the world was designed. In chapter 3 of, of Ephesians, the mystery in Ephesians that Paul talks about is that, in verse 6, it says, in that, that the Jews should be fellow heirs, fellow members of the same body, and fellow partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Now that's how American Standard and New American Standard put it. So fellow members of the body, fellow uh, partakers uh, of his promise. Uh, so we have, we have this promise in Christ, and we should be knowing that we're fellow members, fellow partakers, uh, fellow heirs of this promise in Christ. And then that's the mystery, that Jew and Gentile in Christ are equal. There are no levels of, you know, all of us are saved by the same grace. Some people may be more mature uh, spiritually than others, but Christ's grace fills that all in. There's none of us better than somebody else because we know more. In fact, it says the one that would be your master should be your servant. So the more we know and the more we grow should change us into better servants. And as we serve better, as, and, and I need to learn a lot more too, I'm just like you, I'm forever learning. So we have to make progress. God put everything into the church. And in verse um, 8 here in Ephesians 3, he says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That goes back with the, the mystery revealed in verse 6. And to make all see what is the fellowship, or the, um, I got it written here, stewardship 
of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Uh, New King James adds through Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. To the intent, now, the, the manifold wisdom of God, that's many-sided, manifold means many-sided, wisdom of God might be made known by or through the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're not just talk he's not just talking here about evangelism. He's talking about the eternal design of the church that was made for every ethnic group, every ethnic group. And then, of course, evangelism would go along with that, taking that message throughout the world. But there's no institution that man has ever built that can outdo God, God's building, the church. Because it's not just, it's not Jews only. It's not this only. It's not that only. The word nations in the Great Commissions, the Great Commission, is from the Greek word ethnos. Every, you know, you can't just put an arrow on Ru uh, a little flag on Russia and say Russia has been evangelized. No, it's every ethnic group the gospel is for. Every ethnic group that the blood of Christ is for. So the cross is love. It brings us together. Without forgiving hearts, there can be no unity. Each of us are in the same situation. Romans 3.10 says, There are none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Proverbs 20, verse 9, if you never noticed this verse, it is a great verse because it, it's <laughs> Proverbs and Psalms, they, they are like the essence of God's mind boiled down so we can understand it. Here's what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Now, who can do that? Some nutty person might think so. But none of us can do that. We need the Lord. He is the one that makes us clean through the blood of Christ. He is the one that brings us into the family of God. He is the one that sacrificed that our sin could be wiped away. Our crimes against heaven could be wiped away. Unity is a command. We aren't supposed to speak anything but that which would provide edification or building up. Let's turn over here quickly to Ephesians 4. Verse, um, let's see what I got here. Verse, yeah, we'll start with verse um, uh, 30. Oh, 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Have you ever said anything that did not impart grace to the hearers? I have. And James says the tongue is the hardest thing in the world to control. And it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, clamor means brawling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and... Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear church children and walk in love. So we see there, unity is a command in verse, in verse 32. Uh, Matthew 6, 14 and 15 just comes right out and says, you know, if you don't forgive someone's trespasses against you, God is not going to forgive your sins. So if we want to be forgiven, 
we must first be forgiven and then be forgiving. It's blasphemy to want to be forgiven and then turn right around and not be forgiving yourself. We're supposed to be like God. Like He lets the rain and the sunshine come on the just and the unjust. One of our songs said that this morning. We, Matthew 16, 14 tells us we, have, we need to forgive. We got to forgive, forgive, forgive. What did Peter ask Jesus? How many times shall a man forgive uh, uh, someone? Seven times? He said, no, seven times 70. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about 490 times there. He was talking about when somebody comes to you, you must be willing to forgive. Now, I know there's some difficult things in there, but we're not going to go there this morning. We don't have time. What is our plea of unity as Christ's church? First of all, Acts 4.12 says, There is no name under heaven other than Jesus Christ by which we must be saved. So we have that unity, one Savior. 1 Corinthians 2.2, Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now that didn't mean he never talked about the resurrection, but he's talking about, I didn't come here just to baptize people. I came here to bring people to Christ. And then they'll be baptized. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 tells us those seven ones. It says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, beg you, urge you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. God called us through the gospel with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. You all know that we, all, we don't always like each other, the same people or whatever, but we try hard, don't we? We want to, and that will only come as we try to love. And love means always doing that which benefits the other person. That is agape love. That is agape love. That's the kind of love that God has. He says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body, church, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there's those seven uh, major things of unity. So without forgiving hearts, there can be no unity. And unless we forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. The cross is forgiveness. Unity will bring maturity also. Encouragement will help mature both the encourager and the one who is being encouraged. Hebrews 10 25 talks about the uh, purpose of gathering together. One of the purposes of it, all of us know this verse. It says, beginning with um, verse 24, it says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, he's saying if you forsake the church, if you turn your back on the church, you have no other way of being forgiven. There is only one access route to God, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Colossians is all about. There are no alternative access routes to God. There are a lot of religions on this earth, but only one has Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You may learn good things from those, but you can't be forgiven. Uh, Galatians, uh, Galatians 6 talks about the attitude we're to have when we restore someone because we want to restore them in unity, 
It says in Galatians 6, 1 through 5, it says, Brethren, if a man or a person is overtaken in a tra any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. You don't go to their house and say, don't you know you're going to hell if you quit the church and this is just a terrible example to the community and blah, blah. No, no, that's not how to do it. That's not how, even though that might be right, it's not how to do it. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bury you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I need you. You need me. We need each other. But let each one examine his own works, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Don't be comparing yourself to somebody else. Uh, think of what you're doing. Compare yourself to Christ if you want to compare yourself to someone. For each one shall bear his own load. So here we have, we have a pack on our back. Let's say Jeff and I, as an illustration, we have a pack on our back. That's the burden we personally have to bear. But we got this canoe, and he's at one end of the canoe, and I'm at the other end of the canoe, and we're walking along with the canoe. What are we doing? Bearing one another's burdens. At the same time, we have a burden that only we can bear through the Lord. You know, that there, it's, like, it's like when we lost our oldest son. People didn't know what to say to us. We didn't even know what to say to us. It's, it's one of those things you, you can't get over. Only thing you can do through the Lord is get through, is get through. But we needed people. Paulette and I needed each other. Our ch other children, we all needed each other. Now that's an extreme example. But we each had our own feelings to deal with, but at the same time, we could help the other person. So that's, that's what has to be done. The application of God's word is the only way to spiritually be mature. You remember Hebrews 5, verse 12 through 14, talking about by this time you ought to be teachers. But instead you have to be, you have, you have to be taught the first principles again. So progress is supposed to happen, like one of the requirements of an elder, is that he is supposed to be able to teach. Not just have business meetings, but able to teach. So encouragement will bring us together, and then the application of God's word is what's going to mature us into more usable Christians. Uh, Sister and I were talking this morning about 2 Corinthians 4 and the first few verses of 5 where it talks about, and we're experiencing it too, our bodies are gradually going down, but if we're walking in the light, our spirits are gradually growing. So I don't look like I did when I was 19. It, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but as I walk in the light, my spirit can grow more and be more usable to God. 1 Peter 1, 22 through chapter 2, 1 through 5, uh, Peter talks about this, this uh, very idea. He says in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, says, sent, verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass. This is from Isaiah 46 through 8. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We are going to grow 
as we desire the word like a newborn baby desires milk from its mother. We have to desire it. We can't just say, well, I've read, I've read Galatians once. That's enough. <laughs> uh, no, that just won't work. So uh, unity brings maturity, and that happens as we continue to study the word in whatever form, at home, uh, when we come to Bible class, when we come to worship, as faithful Christians mature, he or she will sin less and less as the years go by, thereby, thereby perfecting holier lives, letting, which will let their light shine brighter and brighter, that we will be exalting the Lord when people see our works. We are the light of the world, a house put on a hill. Matthew 5, uh, 14 through 16 says, Jesus is the light of the world, but the church is the light of the world. And, we're, and we're, he doesn't put something over us. We're, we're up on a hill where people can see us as we live. So faithful Christians mature. We try hard to sin less and less. God blesses us as we walk in the light. Titus 2, 1, 11 through 14 tells us that grace teaches, grace teaches. The cross of God's grace continues to teach us toward maturity. Our unity in the work of the church will fully multiply our results. I found this a long time ago. It, it goes from the, from the letters team, T-A-E-M. And it stands for, together, everyone achieves more. Together, everyone achieves more. The mature local church will plan its work. The men must plan. Share ideas concerning expediencies, things which we think will work the best to get this job done. And sometimes you realize that really wasn't as good, and you go back and you talk about it again, reevaluate, and go a different direction to get the same thing done. We're not talking about deciding on what the word is. <laughs> the word's already set. It's not the purpose of the elders or anybody in the church to redefine somehow God's word. It's already set. But what the scripture says that men make plans, but God guides our steps. I forget what proverb or psalm, psalm that is. It's, it's left my little pea brain here. Christians uh, have been uh, promised a glorious home in heaven. Hope, Christian hope, is not like, well, I hope so. No. Christian hope, you've heard this before, it's nothing new, but we need to be reminded. Christian hope is desire, desire to be saved, and the absolute expectation to be saved based in the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So, communicate clearly, men, and honestly. And I'll tell you something, I've been through lots and lots of business meetings, and I can tell you, it's easy to raise your hand and say yes when you're not the one that has to carry out the work. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Okay, so it's not, we're not just talking about uh, agreeing with one another. That, that, that's there. And women, women must plan. Where, I ask you, with an honest heart, I'm not trying to uh, have all the ladies smile at me or anything or shake my hand later, but honestly, it's been my observation that without the women of the church, the church would go nowhere. I believe that with all my heart. Just like this world would go nowhere if it wasn't for the fact that God took a little bit out of Adam's side and made a woman. And I know when he saw her, after seeing and naming all the animals, I don't know what language he spoke in, but when he first saw her, he must have said, wow, wow. And I used to tell my kids, guess what mom is spelled upside down? Wow. And you don't mess with my girlfriend or you're going to be trouble. She's still my girlfriend. And my kids, you know, they mocked me on that. Oh, yeah, dad, we had to watch out for your girlfriend. 
And so, Christians, uh, we've been promised uh, this thing, this eternal place with God. Jesus says, it's too bad that it's, it's another one that's usually used at funerals, but Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That means he's equating himself with the Father. He's also deity. Believe in me as you believe in God. That's the only answer to that. So, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again that, to get you so that where I am, there you may be also. He's made us that promise. He's made us that promise. People in 1 Thessalonians, they turn from idols to serve God. That's 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. They turned from idols to serve the true or the living and true God and to wait for his son who died and has been resurrected from the dead. They were waiting. We do not know when the Lord comes. Have we lost something? Are we still really waiting? Are we still wanting, anticipating? Are we looking for God? to come in the clouds. Uh, Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for the blessed hope of His appearing. There can be no hope without the cross and without the empty tomb. The healthy church loves. It loves because of the cross. It forgives because of the cross. It matures because of the cross. It works because of the cross. And it hopes because of the cross. The thriving, healthy church has unity at the cross. As we all run to the cross, we have to come together. Backing off from the cross. When you separate from each other, that means you're backing up from the cross. The cross is where the saints gather. There's where we have that unity. We're all sinners, saved by the precious blood of Christ. We must be in unity now so that then when the Lord comes in the sky we will be together then and he's going to swoop us up into glory but if we can't get along here why would God want us in heaven <laughs> you know so um, unity is, is something that that always needs to be mentioned from time to time. And it's not always easy because of personalities for different levels of spiritual growth and whatever. But it can be had. It can be had. God said it could. And the unity in this church in five years may be better than the unity now because people grow. People grow. So set your heart on loving, forgiving, maturing, working, and hoping. Never back up, shut up, or give up. Shake each other's hand. Give each other a hug. Love each other through the bad times. Love each other through the great times. And God will bless us individually and this church or any congregation that works hard, loves enough to have unity. If you have a problem this morning of any kind, if you haven't become a Christian, uh, I want to warn you against Jeff. When I first came in the door, Jeff told me this morning, he said, uh, if anybody needs sprinkled today, we can just bring them out front here. So he might need to be talked to about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought, it was pretty, I thought it was pretty neat, Jeff. <laughs> so if you have a need this morning, we won't sprinkle you, but 
If, if you haven't become a Christian, we ask you to come to Christ this morning and become a Christian. If you have any other need, prayers you need to pray, or whatever, we'll help you in any way we can. As we stand and sing this song, let us come. <laughs>